Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Friends of Flight 93 virtual speaker series. On behalf of the Friends, I would like to welcome you to today's digital program. The Friends of Flight 93 are the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service at Flight 93 National Memorial. The Friends provide resources and volunteer support, as well as raise funds to ensure the memorial maintains its relevancy for generations to come. One of the many educational programs we support is the Speaker Series. During this special 20th commemoration, the Digital Lecture Series showcases the families of Flight 93 as they discuss their loved ones, the passengers and crew members of Flight 93, and for them to share how the events of September 11th changed their lives and the country. This is a recorded program moderated by Brooke Neal. Director of Programs for the Friends of Flight 93 National Memorial. This evening we welcome our guest speakers. First is Flight 93 family member Deborah Borza, who will be discussing the life and legacy of her daughter, passenger Diora Francis Bodley. Diora was the youngest passenger on the plane. Debbie is joined by a friend of Diora's, Greg Kyling. Greg is a member of the Friends of Flight 93 and has been a longtime fundraiser and advocate for Diora, the Flight 93 story, and the memorial. For the speaker series, Greg will share with you his friendship with Diora and Debbie, along with some of the projects he has facilitated to raise funding and awareness for Flight 93 National Memorial. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Um, uh, I know there's some of you from the West Coast and the East Coast, so good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Debbie, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about Diora's name. Can you tell us how you selected the name for your daughter? Diora's name. How did I pick Diora's name? Well, Diora's dad, Daryl Bodley, and myself, we, we thought we'd have a name that began with the letter D. So I took some of the letters out of my name, Deborah and we came up with Diora. Uh, later on in Diora's life, we found out that her name was Gaelic for tears. So it's, uh, it's a, an appropriate uh, name uh, now, but at the time it was a very uh, you know, unique name for Diora and she was a very unique girl. Greg, do you wanna introduce and let us know how you knew Diora as well? Sure. So. Diora and I met uh, her senior year at La Jolla Country Day. Um, she was volunteering at a local animal shelter out here in San Diego, uh, Helen Woodward Animal Center. And I worked at the time, I worked at a residential treatment facility uh, for kids ages six to 13. And uh, once a week on Wednesdays, actually, we would go to the animal center um, about two hours a day, every Wednesday. and. At some point during our in our trips there, Diora and I crossed paths. She's a volunteer there. So that's how she and I met. And the only time I really spent time with her was at the Animal Center. But it was a great time seeing her work with the kids. And uh, they just really took to her. And she and I, like, typical conversations involved music and tattoos. Um, <laughs> so it was uh, we had a good time um, working with the kids together. It was only two hours a week. But definitely one of the highlights of my uh, time at the center was was meeting her and, and being able to spend time with her before she uh, graduated and went off to college. Excellent, thank you. So on September 11, 2001, Diora was returning home from visiting friends. Debbie, would you tell us a bit about how Diora ended up on Flight 93? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Diora ended up as a uh, standby passenger on Flight 93. She was visiting some of her girlfriends before they all started their junior years at college. And uh, her and her girlfriend had stayed up all night. And her girlfriend was uh, going to start her first class uh, on September the 11th. So Dior wanted her girlfriend to uh, get to school on time. So she asked her girlfriend to drop her off early to catch uh, United Flight 93. Uh, Dara's last phone call was to her boyfriend at the time and uh, was letting him know that she would be arriving early at the San Francisco airport. 
Right. So tell us a bit um, about the day of 9-11, how you found out. But I know you've talked about sort of the progression from the day of September 11, 2001 and kind of the next few days and just piecing together what happened. So do you want to take us back to that day? Sure. Um, so I was living in uh, San Diego, California with uh, Diora's sister, Muriel. Muriel is uh, 10 years younger than her sister. And Muriel and I had a, we got up that morning and Muriel was getting ready for school and I was getting ready for work. As a reminder, we were living in San Diego, so we were three hours behind the East Coast. So it was uh, around seven in the morning, uh, California time, that we turned on the television for a bit and saw uh, what was happening in, in New York City with regarding the towers. And uh, then we had to get in the car and, and I had to take Muriel to school and I remember just letting her know that today you know, could be a day like uh, like the day I remember when uh, John F. Kennedy was shot. So we would see how the day would unfold and uh, I would talk to her about the day when I picked her up from school. So I dropped Muriel off at school and I went into work and uh, my Received a phone call from Dior's friend. Uh, she was in tears. Uh, she was screaming that it was all her fault. And I asked her what she was, what she meant. And uh, she let me know that at that time that Dior had caught uh, United Flight 93. And she had just heard a broadcast saying that United Flight 93 uh, had crashed in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, it was very, very upsetting for her. So I asked her to see if she could go back to the airport to see if Diora did get on the plane. And uh, she said she'd call me back and let me know what she found out. Um, I called United Airlines to give them my information. They were unable to give me any information about Diora. And then the waiting started for me. Uh, Dior's girlfriend called me back a while later. She uh, was in, unable to get to the Newark airport to check to see if Dior was there. She let me know that Dior's cell phone had run out of juice. Dior did not bring her charger, so we, we couldn't reach her uh, by her cell phone. Um, I let her girlfriend, uh, suggested to her girlfriend that she go back to school and to be with, you know, some of her friends or maybe go see her counselor there at the school, and I would keep her informed as to what, you know, what transpired. And it was around um, noon, maybe about quarter afternoon, I left uh, where I was working and went across the street to Stella Maris Catholic Church there in La Jolla, uh, Mary Star of the Sea. Um, and I went there and I walked into the church and there were quite a number of people in the church, um, you know, praying uh, for the people who had, had died in the towers. And so I got down on my knees and uh, I prayed as well, asking God if she knew, if, if he knew where Dior was. And I heard this voice say to me that she's with me. And no sooner had I heard that voice than my cell phone rang, and it was United Airlines who then informed me that um, Dior was aboard Flight 93. Um, I remember screaming in the church, and, and I remember people in the church you know, gathering around me. I finally got my composure, and I was able to uh, uh, you know, just get back to the telephone to the agent that was on the other line who I just kind of left there and um, you know said I, I was surrounded by people here at the church um, and that I asked her if she had other phone calls like this to make and she said yes. So I, I said, well, you know, I'll pray for you. You know, it's a conversation I'm sure that was difficult for her. And we hung up. Um, I called my parents. Uh, I called my sister um, and uh, a friend. I also called a friend of mine who came to the church uh, to be with me. Um, 
later on that day, I had to pick up Muriel from school. And on our way home, we stopped at La Jolla Shores, which was a favorite beach for both Muriel and Diora. And it was there that I let Muriel know that her sister had died. Uh, we drove home, and um, later on that evening, friends of mine uh, started to gather at, at my house and just be with me and Muriel. Um, September 12th, I remember Muriel and I sitting around the television waiting to hear more news regarding uh, Flight 93. And after that, uh, my life, you know, and life in general for myself and Muriel uh, had altered. You know, it was just never going to be the same for us anymore. Um, received lots of phone calls from, you know, the people doing uh, recovery there at the site. Uh, received phone calls from the FBI. And uh, it just went on like that. And it still goes on, you know, to this day. Talk to us a little bit since we've had and featured the families of Flight 93 this year for our 20th commemoration virtual speaker series. Can you talk about coming to Somerset for the first time and just sort of what you took in on your first trip? Uh, my first visit to uh, Somerset and to the sacred ground was uh, the end of June 2002, uh, right there at the beginning of July, those, those last few days in there. Um, I, with my parents and my sisters, uh, with Muriel, um, with my friend who was with me at the church, we were all together and we met with the coroner, with Wally Miller, and he took us to, uh, the sacred ground, to the crash site, and proceeded to, uh, let us know, uh, through the investigation that had happened shortly after September the 11th, they let us know what had taken place at the site. Uh, it was something I would never have seen because Wally had you know, done his investigation and then uh, proceeded to lay six inches of topsoil and uh, plant seedlings, grasses, and flowers. So when I went to the site, it was as if Nothing had ever happened there. A uh, very beautiful place. The hemlock trees were out in, a, in the distance. Uh, the uh, drag lines that used to be there, uh, part of the uh, abandoned mining, uh, were still up. So they were there off in the distance. And um, it, it looked different than September the 11th. And it even looks different now as compared to the first time I had, had been to the site. It's definitely uh, changed and grown over the years. And going kind of back to that question, uh, do you want to talk about the development of the memorial and the work you did with different organizations? Yeah, oh, it would be great, yes. Um, Wally Miller had put together a meeting with the uh, Next of Kin uh, in um, February of 2002, I believe it was. And uh, he wanted to let all the family members know all the work that had been done at the site. And it was at that time that Wally had asked me to uh, start contacting all the next of kin and uh, talk to them about forming some kind of organization so that the families could be represented uh, there at, at, the, at the memorial. Well, it wasn't quite a memorial yet, but that came soon after. So I, I took on uh, contacting all the next of kin, ask the, asking them who would like to, you know, create this board, uh, who, who was interested in being president, vice president, things like that, so we could actually form a, a nonprofit organization and then be uh, part of uh, developing that area into what is now, you know, the National Memorial, which is part of the Department of Interior. Um, so that's how it kind of formed. Uh, Daryl Diora's uh, dad was a part of the board members for the families of Flight 93. Uh, they became involved in the 
flight into the uh, Flight 93 Memorial Act, which President Bush had signed, and then you know we started the process of a task force, an advisory commission, um, and uh, which reported to the Department of Interior. And both the task force and the advisory commission consisted of some family members as well. And then as the memorial developed and we were at the 10th anniversary, the park was dedicated as a, as a uh, national park with the National Park Service. Uh, you know, the uh, advisory commission was sunsetted and, you know, the families continued on being a part of the fundraising aspect purchasing property from private landowners, being a part of donated land on the part of PBS Coal, and uh, just kept going and going, building the first phase, the Wall of Names, the second phase being the, the visitor center, and the final phase being the, the power of voices. Absolutely, and especially last year, you know, for so long, this memorial was being built in segments and different phases, like you mentioned. So now that construction is completed and the memorial design is completed, do you have a favorite element or a certain spot that you like to visit? Um, I do, I do, I do have a favorite spot. I My favorite spot is the Wall of Names. My favorite spot is the uh, piece of marble that Diora's name is etched into. And when I walk down the walkway, uh, the plaza there, as I'm walking toward the Wall of Names, and as I just keep walking straight to the Wall of Names, I run right into Diora's uh, marker. And the first thing I do is I lean over and give, you know, give her a kiss and say hello. And then I peek in between her marker and the marker next to her. There's a space in between all of these markers. And I look behind there to see what there is behind there. It, usually it's wildflowers in the spring and the summer. I, I've been there in the fall, so I, I see uh, a change of season in fall. And then in the winter, you know, the snow that's accumulated behind the wall of names. And it just brings to mind, you know, where where she now is. You know, her remains are there. And, you know, to be with her during all the seasons that are there at the, uh, at the park. So during one of our polls, when we first started uh, the program tonight, about 60, 68% of tonight's viewers have visited the memorial, but in particular, do you feel there's, uh, what, is, what is the most important piece of the story for visitors to learn, to share, to take into their own lives? Is there a certain aspect that you want people to take away from tonight's program? Yes, um, for those who have visited, thank you so much for coming out to the memorial. I know that it, you know, took something to uh, come off the turnpike or come down Lincoln Highway to enter into the park. So thank you for your visitation. For those who haven't, you know, maybe sometime, somewhere, someday you'll you'll be able to visit the memorial. I, I certainly hope so. And for those, when you do visit, for all of you, you know, I suggest that you go into the visitor center. And there's a section in the visitor center where there's a picture of everyone that was on board, the passengers and the crew. And there's an opportunity to uh, use that computer display that's, that's below these pictures. And you can touch on their picture and what comes up is information about who was on board. And, you know, for me to have you and resonate with someone on that flight. You know, maybe you're a teacher. You know, we had someone who uh, was a retired teacher on board. Maybe you have a love for the national parks or uh, fish and wildlife. We had people on there who were heading to Yosemite. We have a passenger who was, um, was involved in fish and wildlife. 
uh, business people were on board, uh, young adults were on board, and Yura is on board. And her love for children and her desire to graduate Santa Clara University, double majoring in French and child psychology, and her dream to become a doctor in child psychiatry. Maybe there's someone out there listening now that you know they resonate with uh, what it's like to be a college student or dreaming uh, about what they would you would like to do in your life. So you know to take away uh, your opportunity to make a difference in the quality of your life or in the quality of your family or your friends or your coworkers. You know, that's what I would like you to take away. Uh, the difference that the people on board Flight 93 made for us in sacrificing their life uh, and the opportunity that you all have to make a difference. Craig, we want to talk a bit about uh, the fundraising that you've done in Diora's honor. So would you like to share some of your efforts with us and how you choose to keep her memory alive? Sure. Um, so as I stated earlier, the, the one one of the, the one of the main connections that we had developed when we saw each other at the animal center was, well, it was pretty obvious that, you know, we both love working with kids. So there was that. And but most of our conversations revolved around music. And my first trip to the memorial was December 26th of 2006. And I won't go into the details. I remember it like it was literally an hour ago, but standing there was where I really had a reconnection with her. And she kind of spoke to me and was like, this is a way for you to help cope with what's going on, what's happened. And, you know, uh, this is a way for you to keep uh, my memory alive and the other families, their, their legacies alive is through the power of music. And I was like, in my head, the light bulb went off. And it was just like, I'm standing there staring out at the sacred ground, like 800 yards in front of me. And I'm thinking, benefit show. And because I knew that the memorial at, had been signed into law and I was like, I need to help build this memorial. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I channeled all this energy and anguish and sadness into, that I was carrying for years into something like, being in, into something positive. I channeled it into connecting with everybody I know in the music scene out here with my idea of raising money for the memorial. And everybody out here was on board with it from the word go. So basically, I honestly lost count. I wanna say it's between 25 and 27 benefit shows that we've done out here since the first one was 9-11, 2007. And then it was such a great thing from the start. <laughs> we did another one in December that year. And then like I was doing like two a year. And then we whenever Dior's birthday fell on a Friday or Saturday, we would I would facilitate a show on her birthday also. So it was quite a quite a lot of shows. And um, we raised and early on when Debbie and I after we had met in 2007 um, when the memorial was you know the design had been presented and everything we had a chat and um, we were talking about the tower and she was like how will your money go to the tower <laughs> so I was all I was totally on board with that because I just love looking at the concept of it and the fact that the, the tower has that's that's my favorite element of the memorial because the tower is about music it's about each chime representing a passenger or crew member and they all have their own distinct sound which represents their individuality but together they make this incredible music and given all the efforts that i've done to try and raise money for the tower that is definitely my favorite element of the memorial um so there's that all the benefit shows and then i created team diora a couple of years ago um we have the 9 11 memorial stair climb in san diego every year <clears throat> and I created a team a few years ago um, to raise money um, to in Dior's memory uh, to benefit firefighter aid and some other related charities like the fallen um, uh, God what is it the far uh, fallen firefighters um, national fallen firefighters uh, firefighter cancer support network um, psych armory institute so there's some really great charities that team dior has helped raise money and awareness for uh, over the last few years so i'm just really happy that san diego and all my friends in the music scene and 
just people in general have really taken to helping me help keep her memory alive. That's kind of been my my goal since this all started is I just don't want that light to fade. And uh, I just can be more proud of all the support from everyone I've got. Amazing. And thank you for all those efforts, you know, the fundraising and the awareness. Um, it's so much appreciated on our end, too. So, Debbie, welcome. shifting back to you, I know there's a specific award at Diora School that's now awarded in her honor. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, Diora School, La Jolla Country Day for the high schoolers. I'm sorry, La Jolla Country Day is a pre kindergarten through 12th grade. And um, at the time Diora was attending, uh, she was a lifer. She went to La Jolla Country Day her whole life. And as a high schooler, they're all required to do 40 hours of community service. And these high schoolers go above and beyond. 40 hours of, of community service. Um, so they had the alumni of La Jolla Country Day always had an award, the Alumni Award of Service, and they would give this award to a, a senior a young woman or a young man who showed, you know, all, who had, you know, gone above and beyond in their altruistic service to the community. And after Diora passed away, the alumni changed the award to the Diora Bodley Alumni Award of Service uh, because of Diora's uh, service as a community service work at the school. Um, I think now would be a, a, a good time. Uh, when Diora was applying for uh, college uh, at Santa Clara University, where she was a, a student, she would have been in her junior year. Uh, in 2001. But on Diora's application to Santa Clara University, she spoke about a number of, um, of volunteer work that she did uh, at, uh, as, a senior, as a high schooler. And one of the things she volunteered in was uh, a, the Special Olympics. So when she was in 12th grade, she, she volunteered her time with the Special Olympics. And there, I'd like to just read what she wrote on her, uh, her application to Santa Clara. She said, this tournament was held at our school, La Jolla Country Day School, and lasted from about 11 to 4 in the afternoon. She said, I played on a team and then was a judge for two or three games. This, too, was quite a rewarding and enjoyable experience. The excitement and high level of competition did in no way decrease the camaraderie or fun. No matter the level of skill or achievement, the fact that they made such a valiant effort was the real accomplishment. I learned that this is not just what a person gets out of the experience, but how much they put into it. The ability to maintain a positive outlook when placed in a difficult place is far more valuable than simply not accepting the challenge at all. So, uh, you know, that was just one of many things that Diora did um, as a high schooler for community service. And when she went into college at Santa Clara University, she continued that. Um, she volunteered her time through the America Reads program and she uh, participated in an after-school reading program at St. Clair's Elementary School. So she affected approximately 60, you know, first and second graders uh, who have now had gone to college, have now graduated from college. Wow, which is something to think about. You know, a stat that we keep throwing around on the Friends of Flight 93 side is the millions and millions of young people who were, you know, born after 2001. So to know that she kind of reached some of those um, young kids who are now young adults, that's pretty special. Yeah, so, uh, Debbie, I want to talk a little bit just about the initiative and your work with the September 11th National Memorial Trail. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the other, and I still continue to participate in this area, um, is a uh, with the September the 11th National Memorial Trail Alliance. 
And back in 2001, there was already happening this uh, gathering of, of bicyclists. Um, and uh, when they heard of the Pentagon and everything else that was happening on that day, uh, David Brickley, who was uh, a cyclist and part of this event, um, decided he wanted to do something, make something happen. So since then, uh, he has put together a board, uh, honorary board members, advisors, other cyclists, uh, and he's created, with the help of all these, these people, a 1,300-mile trail, hiking, biking trail, that connects the three sites, the World Trade Center, Pentagon, and Flight 93 National Memorial. And it was just last week, through David's efforts, that Congress passed HB 2278. And what that bill was asking for was just, was recognition, recognition by the Park Service that this was a national memorial trail for September the 11th, 2001. So just as, just as early as last week, we're, we're very excited. Um, can't wait to see what happens when it goes through the Senate. You know, we're, just, we're reaching out to all of our senators, asking them to uh, be in support of this bill. And um, then we can truly say that this is the September the 11th National Memorial Trail with a designation from the Department of the Interior from the National Park Service. So thank you, Flight 93, thank you. So we've got one last question here before we have a few questions from the audience. So Debbie, you were awarded PA's Volunteer of the Year. So could you tell us a little bit about your work that earned you this accolade? Sure, um, one of the things I never expected was a phone call from uh, someone who worked at SCI Laurel Highlands. And that's a state prison facility there in, in Somerset. And she had called to ask if I'd be interested in speaking at the uh, prison's day of responsibility, which is a day that the uh, inmates, along with the staff, they put on this day of responsibility particularly focused at inmates who would be, uh, at some point in their sentencing, would be eligible for parole. And I, I just said yes, not really knowing all of what it was, and, and showed up and, uh, in 2012 and started to speak at not just Laurel Highlands Day of Responsibility, but other prison institutions there in the state of Pennsylvania at their Days of Responsibility and then became involved with the impact of crime classes where inmates eligible for parole would attend a 25 class, approximately 25 people per class, and to talk about the impact of a violent crime. And I would go to these prisons and I would talk to them about the impact of, of September the 11th, knowing that a majority of these inmates in front of me had also been impacted that day, whether they were in prison or outside of prison. And it was a way for us to get related in the impact of a violent crime and, the, and a sudden, out of nowhere, crime that, that happened. And then I would ask them to just reflect on the impact of their crime on their victim or their family, their community, and uh, so it was a, a way to uh, have them take a look at being responsible for, for their crime. And in 2015, uh, the state of Pennsylvania, the Department of Corrections honored me with the, uh, the award of Volunteer of the Year. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that's something that a lot of people might not think of. So. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us and answering our questions and being with us tonight. I know we have a few questions from the audience, so let me take a look here. Uh, the first one is for Greg. They're asking if you are still planning any concerts in Dior's memory or if you have anything coming up here in the works. Yeah, actually, um, so, T so the 9-11 stair climb, 
um, usually happens on or around the anniversary here in San Diego. But last year it was canceled because of the pandemic. Me and one of my uh, team members, uh, Judy, we did our own stair climb because we weren't gonna let COVID stop us from doing this, you know? So <laughs> we went to her office building and, and climbed 115 stories. Uh, it's not 115 stories, but her building is 23 stories and we, we did it five times. And um, anyway, for this year, Team DR is doing the same thing again, only this year we'll have some additional members doing the climb on the morning of the anniversary. And yes, there is, uh, I'm doing a, uh, another September 11th benefit show on that night, on the night of the anniversary. So it's three local bands. And um, my, the, the feedback I'm getting is that a lot of people are coming to this one. This it could be, I've been stressing it's the 20th anniversary. This is very, this is an extra special show. And, you know, we're coming off, you know, we're still technically, I guess, in the pandemic, but we couldn't have it last year because of all this stuff. So, um, we're finally able to have a show again this year and uh, we've just really been pushing it and uh yeah it's going to be a great show we're really excited so yes there will be another show um I, I usually the flyer i'll post the flyer if anyone's on social media um i'll i usually post the flyer on facebook there's an event page um the show is called 20 years we remember honor now and forever and it's at brick by brick in san diego on saturday september 11th 2021 so. Great. So hey, hey. here's a question from a volunteer ambassador. What is something about Diora that you would like us to share with memorial visitors, or is there anything you'd like you know us to take away from your daughter's life and legacy? You know, I'd like the volunteers to share the love that Diora had for her sister Muriel. There were you know ten years difference. I have a sister of mine who's who's 10 years younger than I am. And, um, you know, I'll admit my relationship with her was not like the relationship that Muriel and Diora had. I love my baby sister. Um, and this relationship that Muriel and Diora had was very special. The kind of relationship where, you know, Diora would set Muriel in her lap and they'd play the video game Dr. Mario the kind of relationship where Diora would be playing high school basketball and, and at the end of the game, Muriel would run across the, the court and Diora would just pick her up. And I know I'd walk over to congratulate Diora and it was like, mom, don't touch me. I'm all sweaty. And then Diora would take Muriel into the locker room for the uh, team's debrief. So that kind of relationship where Muriel was always included in what Diora was up to, right down to hanging out into her bedroom with her girlfriends and, and going shopping and uh, just, just all of those things that Diora loved to do, she would include her sister. So, uh, you know, the volunteers can share the special relationship that Diora and Muriel had. Great. So uh, before we wrap up, wrap up here tonight, is there anything you both would like to say to our audience? Well, um, I was just going to say um, thank you to everybody who is tuning in and watching, um, whether it's just one person or a hundred people or what have you. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, I made I made a promise to Dior and her and to Debbie that I will, as long as I'm walking the earth, I will do whatever I have to do to make sure that her memory is not forgotten. So thank you for tuning in. And I definitely hope to see all of you at the show if you're able to make it. And, and please message me or whatever if you have any questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them. And let's see, last words. Um, thank you for all of you at, attending today, this evening. Um, I made a promise to uh, those in the church on September the 11th, 2001, that I would always be courageous and loving and open and available to all who wanted to share their story of where they were on September the 11th or where, what it was like for me on September the 11th. And uh, for all of those who were born after September the 11th, again, you know, I'm, I'm available and open to uh, discussions with you always. Um, 
Thank you so much again. Thank you for just being with Greg and I this evening. All right. Thank you both so much. And, you know, we like to tell everyone who's still listening in our audience that you can continue uh, to help these programs remain relevant and accessible by donating to support these programs and the Friends Education Outreach efforts by visiting flight93friends.org. And lastly, we will be approaching the 20th anniversary of 9-11 in September. So we encourage you to honor and remember the 40 from wherever you are. And lastly, we'll be holding another digital program end of September. So we hope you'll join us again. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Mm. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.